Hi, I'm Stephen Carson coming at you from St. Louis, Missouri in these United States. And unlike what the screen says, I do not have my wife with me. So let me fix that. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Leftover from the Mrs. Radlib stream, which did on Saturday, which I recommend on uh, dressing like a lady in case you missed that. It'll be of interest to gentlemen as well, I expect. Um, Mad Mercenary has charged me to mention something I have not been mentioning enough, which is that every year uh, after Christmas, we get some judges together and we judge contributions to a contest. Um, we've done uh, monetary design, uh, flag design, vexillology, I believe is the right term. Uh, this year, it's going to be book cover design, so a rather more ambitious challenge. But I think this has resulted in some uh, less entrance than we usually have. So I, I did want to push it. We usually send out some... Um, hard money of some sort, silver coins so far in the past. Someday our budget will get bigger and we'll do better than that, but probably more silver coins this year. We do mail them to you, um, the, the winners, and most of all, it's a lot of fun to see uh, the effort that people put in from our uh, crowd. It's just a great time, and, and one of our most popular streams every year is the judging stream, where we've had people like John D and um, Simia Gog and uh, Pharaoh come on and uh, and they they treat it serious, you know, and they really give an, a, an aesthetic criticism of the entries and it's, it's just great fun. Anyway, so really encourage you to be part of that. Look in the Discord, which is linked in the video description and uh, join in the community and then you'll find your, there's a channels that uh, explain the rules and you can see the other entries that have been done to get an idea of what's going on with that. Really would love to see your work this year. Okay. Um, Otherwise, uh, thanks for additional support recently on Subscribestar. Most people um, just chip in five bucks a month to support the show. It's really appreciated. Someone was a little more generous than that recently uh, in their in their monthly subscription. So really appreciate it. Thank you. A lot of people are anonymous, so I just try to. Hopefully they're listening and they know I feel thankful. Okay, so uh, to cover to continue in the left wing terror series. We are now going to talk about the um, Red Terror, I'm probably going to say it wrong, the Terror, terror Rojo uh, during the Spanish Civil War. And joining me to discuss this is Mr. Panama Hat. Hello, sir. Uh, good evening. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I should say back again, um, though yes. I, my memory is so poor, I, I can't remember what the, what the last occasion no, I'm was. De I'm determined to find it. Once I get you talking, yes. I'm going to find the stream where you were before and, and share it, because if... I think it might be the sort of prequel to this, namely our discussion of the Spanish Civil War as a, uh, I guess you'd call it a military topic, so to speak. Maybe um, the thing I've, I've I've done so many um, streams on Spain now they all just blur together. <laughs> so. Yeah. So is this a special interest of yours? Yes, uh, it is very much so. Um, the Spanish Civil War has always kind of interested me, um, and I've been doing quite heavy research on the topic for a few years now. Oh, good. Um, okay. Yeah. the 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 main issue, of course, is that so a lot of the information and sources are, of course, in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, and there just hasn't been the work done by English speaking historians. And of course, the issue in, in Spain is that they have a kind of moratorium until fairly recently on on really studying the Civil War in depth and really doing really? the research and going through the archives. Well, yes, of course, because um, it was considered such a kind of, um, I suppose, traumatic event that while it was within living memory, it, it, it was it was just considered by pretty much everybody, you know, slightly sort of too much to um uh you know to just, sort of to, to dig into that deeply let's just not talk about it sort of like the uh, the, yeah. the, the world war ii generation right just just don't kind bring of it up. there's <laughs> there's 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 a special name for it um which i'm sure narco republican down in the chat uh will remind me of because he actually is a spanish-speaking person mm. um and uh a, 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 a long-time supporter of mine uh, but yes, there is, there is a specific term for it, but that, that's basically the issue. So yes, I've done a lot of quite grinding uh, reading and sort of looking up obscure old books on Spain and, you know, finding accounts of people that w went out there, um, that kind of thing. Um, I know that I know that uh, everybody in these circles is, is familiar with um, uh, Mine Were of Trouble by, um, is it uh, Peter Kemp? 
um, who was a, a an English law student who went out to fight for the nationalists in 1936. Mm. Um, things like that. Very interesting books. Um, and uh, I've pretty much always been a, a nationalist sympathizer. Um, it must be said. <laughs> I won't, I've, 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 I've never hidden that. Um, right. Though, of course, I do. I do take an objective sort of view as I can of, of events in the wars. Any good historian should, I think. Right. Right. And and just to be clear, um, <clears throat> I am not trying to be even handed in this series on left wing terror. My basic perspective is that um, uh, the the real sins and many imagined ones on the opponents of the left have been discussed ad nauseum um, mm -hmm. and movies made about them and, you know, their names go down in infamy forever, you know. Um, uh, whereas we do not get the uh, story of the left-wing side of things, the, you know, the, the left-wing crimes very well. And so um, I think, uh, you know, fascism... Uh, Franco, um, the nationalists during the Spanish Civil War, these all have a black mark in sort of the average person's perspective who doesn't really dig into these things and just sort of absorbs it from the from the air of our culture. They're going to just automatically have a negative view towards these things, right? Mm -hmm. um, but how many people would think of the uh, Republicans during the Spanish Civil War as people who tortured and killed priests, say? Many people just wouldn't even, average people just might not even know that. Um, if no. you and I, if you and I were writing the history books, Panama hat, hopefully we wouldn't whitewash. Oh, it would be. We wouldn't would whitewash very, any, very different. Yeah, we wouldn't whitewash, uh, you know, we wouldn't whitewash anything, uh, you know, but well, will, it would be more, I, it would be, you would know about the, the left wing terror side of the story, which uh, to, in various ways is kind of buried, frankly. Well, the the, the, tr the trouble with Spain, of course, is that is that most uh, people in the English speaking world know very little about the Civil War at all, um, right. if they know anything about it. And um, what they do know tends to be this kind of very romantic depiction mm -hmm. um, that has this intertwined with, you know, all these famous writers and artists and kind of these liberty loving, freedom loving, you know, right. wonderful, interesting, good people going off to Spain and fighting the faceless fascist menace, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and what what I've always said is that in regards to the West, um, Franco may have may have may have won the war, but uh, the kind of kind of art and and uh, letters have have certainly won the peace, um, if you see what right. I mean. Um, yep. they kind of they easily won the struggle for um, propaganda. And kind of putting their side forward as as the un unambiguous good side. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of so again, it's this very sort of cartoonish, one sided view of the war as a kind of as a kind of s struggle between you know the kind of oppressed working class versus these you know horrible nameless fascist beasts. Um, there, there's 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 a big fixation on female Republican fighters, um, of oh. which there were. Of which oh, were the, uh, basically none. La, la pensionaria, la passionaria, um, la passionaria. Well, of course, we well, of course, she 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 wasn't a soldier. She was an orator. She was a communist, ah. um, an, an orator who gave gave, in in fairness to her, some some genuinely quite you know rousing speeches about about the defense of Madrid. But they love to use photographs of like women in boiler suits with handkerchiefs around their neck, carrying rifles, wearing berets, you know. Again, those were those were propaganda images at the time. They're propaganda images now, and they serve a very specific purpose, which is to basically whet the appetites of kind of uh, left leaning people for the kind of romantic rep Republican cause. It, it's it's right. fascinating that you know everybody is taken in by kind of romantic um, in, romantic sort of uh, romantic ideas of certain historical causes that they'll never they'll never actually be able to fight for. But, you know, uh, it's interesting because kind of leftists and Marxists are some of the most susceptible people to that, you know, even, <laughs> even more than anybody else. So, so you're um, saying La, La, Passionaria, La, 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 La Passionaria or whatever and, and similar uh, women were the Iranian teen girls of their time. That's what you're telling me, right? You kind of, <laughs> yes. You could, you could compare it to that. You could. Um, 
Okay, so uh, one thing else I wanted to mention before we plunge into it, which is just that one thing that's different between the show we did before, which I'm pretty sure we did. I'm just having trouble finding it. Um, <laughs> and, and now, or certainly other times, uh, Panama Hat and I have talked, is that we have met in real life since then. Um, yes, indeed. We, we, we got to a, a, it was. An, a, attend an event together and um, have a lot of time, actually. Uh, uh, talking yeah, and hanging good. out and stuff. So, it, so uh, we, really nice. we, we 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 went off to a, a room and um, Curtis Yarvin came in and we had right. a kind of uh, we had the kind of back and forth on on America and we talked about whales, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And I I just uh, my only regret is that I had so much more I wanted to talk to Panama Hat about. I know we'll, it's so we'll, it's we'll, so, we'll, so hard to cram we'll everything into those three days. Yeah, and uh, I have to say as well. Uh, of course, you gave a, a speech at the event that was absolutely fantastic. Um, for Thank for you. my for my money for my money, it was it was basically the best speech given. Um, Thank you. Sir. Absolutely, absolutely top class. Yeah, and I I don't know how much I've talked about it on the show, but just in case somehow someone hasn't heard of it, it's not on my channel because it was filmed uh, by the Lotus Eaters crew for the Shildings crew that put on the conference. So you can find. I'm sorry, it's not hosted on my channel. You can find it because I have a playlist that I feature with my guest appearances. And it's not the most recent, it might be the most recent guest appearance. Um, you'll see me giving a, a speech called The Vanguard of Christendom. And the topic was the early church, basically how did the early church end up winning in the Roman Empire? Uh, because um, I wanted to draw some parallels between say, a challenge we face in facing an empire that seems to be completely locked up and unified against us. And uh, I wanted to give some kind of sense of hope by showing that it's been done before. So anyway, that was that speech. Okay, let's get into it. And the tricky part is we're not going to spend a whole bunch of time. We're going to spend uh, about an, an hour from now, Panama. And so mm -hmm. there's much deep context we could give. We could start as usual with history, we could start thousands of years before to really understand why Spain was the way it was. And Where... wouldn't I just love to do that? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but but how do we, uh, I you know, in this series, I really want to focus on, um, you know, a brief sketch of the, of the circumstances or the political, military, whatever circumstances, but focus more um, on the left-wing terror, right? So, how can you quickly give us an executive summary of how, by, say, early mid-30s, Spain is on the verge of civil war and, in particular, um, uh, Catholic Church, the Catholic Church, this will be important later, the Catholic Church seems to be kind of enlisted on one side, or at least that's the way some people paint it. Go ahead. So um, I'll just start by saying that if people do want a more um, in-depth run up to this, um, go to uh, Turnip's channel. Um, I did a stream with him a few weeks ago. Uh, Lady of Shalott has provided a link down there. So if, if you do want the sort of the, the detailed um, run up where I very quick in about six hours, I went through uh, Spain from um, the Bourbon Restoration um, up to the Spanish Civil War. Um, that, that will give you the info you need. Um, long story short, um, so so Spain uh, actually has quite a long history of violent politics. Um, it's kind of something that you see all over sort of Spain and in Latin America as well, um, and in and to a lesser extent in the Portuguese world as well. But the the thing is that you know, kind of. See, again, I'm worried because that this sounds like a slightly kind of Whiggish sort of liberal thing to say. But I, I suppose the, the, whole, the whole idea around politics being something you do through the ballot box just never really took on until recently. And even then, you know, not in the same way. Um, you know, politics was something that was dominated by kind of local bosses who worked for, you know, higher ups in, in, in the parliament or in the monarchy or in, it's, it's that, that, that kind of thing. And um, disagreements were fought out hand to hand, you know, uh, mano a mano. Um, I mean, I mean, we have we have inklings of this in like early American history, where politicians would have yes. dual duels with each other and stuff like that. But you're yes. you're saying that think about that bit in American history, except that's like more normal. <laughs> and, that, um, and there you well, go, Spanish politics, right? <laughs> I I would actually, I mean, so the thing is that I mean, the, the whole thing of like you know, sort of. Um, 
you know, if you think of like uh, Andrew Jackson, you know, old uh, Hickory, right. you know, him him fighting duels with with sort of um, with sort of rival um, gentlemen is sort of very civilized compared to what goes on in Spain. Ah. Um, I I I don't know if the if you want to impose a limit on how graphic we can get on this channel. Um, Actually, yeah, I did want to mention that I I should have mentioned uh, the left wing terror series kind of comes with a warning, and I'll say it now. Um, mm -hmm. The whole point of this is to bring home um, some of the uh, appalling cruelties uh, because I I think that people just just don't know, you know, and they still have this image of left-wingers as, you know, idealistic and, you know, they're just doing it for their love of humanity or something. And I, I, I hope that through this series, people will be left with a very different image, a very different idea of uh, what the real motivations were, simply by talking about the facts of what they did. So, yes, we, we are very explicit during the left-wing terror series. You are, so. are going to hear some explicit things, yes. Yeah. Um, so, basically, the comparison would be you know, old Hickory and his jewels in Spain. Um, this is this is something that goes all the way back to the Napoleonic invasion, um, where Spanish peasants formed bands of um, guerrillas, which is literally um, that means little wars, um, and they would like you know kidnap French troops, strip them, remove their genitalia while they were still alive and place it in their mouth and then leave the corpse there for other french troops to find basically you know to wow. total just 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 unabashed terror campaign against against the invaders um mm. and you know you know the the way that that like you know some some peasants in in rival towns would solve a disagreement is that you would head over there with a pistol or a knife and you would just deal with it basically um depending on when exactly it was some regions are more violent than others um it's uh yeah it's 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 a it's a much more primal way of dealing with politics um so the first event i want to deal with in the run up to this and i'm keeping this as concise as possible is the uh the bloody week um or this semana tragica which happens in 1909 i believe in barcelona um and the prelude to this is basically that um there's a war going on in spanish morocco against against warring tribes the military is fighting very incompetently um and taking a lot of losses this the army is entirely made up of um rather unenthusiastic conscripts from all over spain mm -hmm. um the working classes are suffering quite badly during this they the economy is is not doing particularly well there's a lot of uh, poverty, especially in the cities and in the big agricultural estates where loads of these kind of landless itinerant peasants sort of wander around doing uh, doing seasonal work. They are, um, are basically on the verge of, 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 of starvation. Um, and to make matters worse, if a man gets conscripted for the army, there's no provision made for his family. You know, it's, it's not like where you get drafted, I suppose, in a modern country where I presume your family receive, you know, basically uh, uh, some kind of salary as part of your salary, you know, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that they're not just going to starve if you get called off to war. That doesn't exist. Um, so if you're a Spanish conscript, you get a very meager pay and you're probably going to die due to incompetence in, in Africa in a war that you have no interest or reason to, to want to fight and your family are back are going to be back home starving because you're not there to provide for them. Um, you know, you can you, you can you can kind of see why tensions are running high. Uh, and essentially some men who are bound for Morocco um, start a riot. This gets out of control. And before long, there is widespread looting um, up the uprising, the police and the civil guards uh, and, and the army come in. And this is one of the earliest instances of this of what we will see in this period, the the attacks on churches. You know, um, mobs, um, as I said, they attack churches, they loot anything valuable, they smash the place up, they burn the structure um, if they have enough fuel. Um, they also attack monasteries and uh, nunneries and um, do all kinds of um, sort of, as you can imagine, kind of quite disgusting acts in that regard. Um, I'm sorry, what year is this? Uh, so this is 1909. 
Wow. Okay, so why are they um, taking it out on the uh, church in 1909? Because it's just seen as well, part the of the reason, establishment? Or? It's, it's to do with that. So the reason that all the historians give is because... Um, the church is in, in Spain, it, it's a pillar of the social order explicitly. Mm. Um, mm. Basically, the monarchy, the church, the army, they're all seen as being part of a particular vision of what Spain is. Um, and uh, very often the, the church in Spain was an actively socially conservative force. And it would very often, in, in an attempt to kind of create some social harmony, it would sort of try and make accords between landowners and peasants and factory employers and peasants uh, and, and workers. The trouble is that, that very often this was construed, or in some cases it basically was or was seen as um, the church just being this kind of reactionary organ that um wanted to basically keep the poor ignorant and 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 well poor you know um so there was so, a lot and, of and anger so, against it from certain and, sections they they were they acted in an anti-revolutionary manner in the sense that it, it wasn't so much that i mean maybe the maybe the church in some cases thought that the landowners were not acting right or whatever but overall they were trying to yeah, avoid that, that happened a lot yeah, they were trying to avoid chaos and violence. Um, but the net result of that is if you wanted to like radically change Spain, you saw the church as one of the things in your way, right? Very much so. Um, it, ha it had to be done away with, obviously, as, as well. You, you, you have to remember that at this time in Spain, the church has a total cultural and educational monopoly, which is enforced by law. So all education, um, bar one or two exceptions, has to be Catholic. Um, Got it. Culturally, you know, uh, priests and the, and the clergy exert large influence. Um, the monarchy, although King Alfonso the Thirteenth is far from what we would call a good Catholic, he lends his full support to the church as an institution. Um, you also have a bit of an issue where you, this this whole problem that, that, that sort of prop, that crops up in church history that you get where a lot of priests are basically uneducated, um, especially in rural areas. Um, people who are being ordained as priests are um, receiving practically no education. It's said that some of them are even, are even illiterate. Um, they're basically just chosen from the peasantry, given a rudimentary education in how to say mass and some theology and kind of, and kind of just made priests. Um, and the trouble, of course, you have with this is that these people tend to be um, not particularly good at, at, well, you know, being priests because they've not been educated well enough. And they tend also to just be very, very kind of bluntly conservative, um, you know, kind of total, um, totally rigid preservation of the order that exists, which isn't particularly helpful if you're, say, a, uh, a rural Spanish peasant who is, you know, starving and freezing and is sick of the way that things are being run, sick of all this local corruption in your government, mm -hmm. and your priest is this, you know, barely educated sort of fool who's just saying you know don't make trouble everything's good everything's as it should be you know um, so, so the priest so, is seen as sort of a bought off peasant uh it yes in areas where that's happening but you know that's yeah. that's not representative of all of spain you know very yeah. very different depending on where you go but that that is happening in some regions um and of course the hierarchy as a whole begins to get quite afraid of revolution um and you know always worried that they're going to be targeted by um kind of left wingers i i i should mention that um radicalism has had quite a strong hold on the spanish peasantry and working class for some time by by this point um there's quite a strong presence of communists and anarchists um i believe by 1930 the the largest the largest trade union which is the uh, cnt which I think is Confederación Nacional de Trabajadores or the um, National Confederation of Workers has, I think, nearly two million members, um, and the and the Anarchist Federation, which is its main rival, has a million members. Um, you know, both the enormous trade unions, basically. Right. Um, there, there's a whole rabbit hole I could go down if we were doing more of an economics thing about um, anarchist uh, sort of worker cooperatives 
Um, I might have even talked about it on the show at some point, but there, there's actually some fairly successful ones in Spain um, where, where they do have yes. long running examples of, you know, basically the workers own the company. Um, and, uh, and so Spain in that way is um, rather more anarchistic than just about any place in the world I can think of, really. <laughs> mm. Um. Yes, it's it's very 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 polarized. As I said, you as as you mentioned, these kind of large anarchist communes and all this kind of um, sort of trade union radicalism on the one hand, and this very conservative, um, hierarchical Catholic Spain on the other. And you know, you can you can very easily see the the foundations of of what's going to come with the war. You know, I mean, essentially, this is this is what always sort of concerns me. What concerns me when I think about America now. It's because the reason that Spain could be torn in half so easily is because it, it was two competing visions for what Spain was or would be that were not compatible in any way. Gotcha. You cannot have kind of landowning Catholic monarchy based Spain and, you know, Republican trade unionist worker based cooperative, you know, no, no gods, no king Spain. You know, mm -hmm. one of these visions is not one. One has to win out. You can't have both, and they, and not ultimately it. it will be decided by force. And I, and I often worry, you know, or well, not worry, but sort of you know think. I suppose is you know looking at America now. Are you not almost at that point, basically, where you've got right. you know two completely exclusive visions for what the country is? Um, right. Yes, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's, it's like but. it's like what what compromise. Uh, back then, or or in the case of the U.S. now, what compromise was even on the table, or that people could even imagine, right? That's the exactly. problem. Exactly. You you can't even like. Exactly. Let's say you, you with the best will in the world, you're like, okay, we need to find a way forward to live together. Okay, what would that be? <laughs> no one knows. There's a there's a there's a fantastic book which is available in Spanish, but it's worth um getting and reading through it or trying to translate it. Um, by a, a politician, a notable politician of the period called uh, Jose Maria Gil Robles. And the book is called, uh, if you forgive my bad Spanish, it's um, uh, uh, Paz no fue posible, or peace was not possible, basically. Um, wow. Because, you know, as, as you said, you, you, can't, you can't reach a kind of accord between these two visions. It's one or the other. Um, and um, uh, uh, the wonderful uh, Scottish philosopher um alistair mcintyre um uh who i spoke to um a few years ago and met uh he mentions in his book uh after virtue um that for example if you look at america now there's no there's no compromise on the abortion issue right you can either yeah. have legalized abortion or abortion is illegal really like I know that there's the whole thing is like, well, we can just do it on a, on a, on a sort of state by state thing, but it's like, not really. It doesn't work mm -hmm. like that. You know, either you can murder infants or you can't murder infants. There's no, right. you know, there isn't really, a, there's, there, there's no middle ground between those two visions. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's, it's, that's basically, you know, that that's what we're dealing with here. Don't, I don't want people to see this as like a kind of mild political conflict between like socialists and capitalists. It's not, it's, it's a, it's a deeply, metaphysical struggle for what spain is at heart to to use um, souls uh souls title um thomas souls title a conflict of visions right yes essentially you could you, could, right. you can you can call it that and now, yeah and it, and it means and, and it means that in the absolute sense now what catches my attention here is that you started in 1909 and you're saying even then you see this conflict of visions at least certainly it's nascent um and that means then that a lot of the tensions, which we're about to talk about how they exploded, were already there uh, prior to the Bolshevik Revolution in the Soviet Union. Now, the, the Soviets do end up playing a role, which we'll get to, but um, Spain already had its own situation <laughs> before, even before, uh, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution happened, raising, you know, the, the yes. very real possibility of more such revolutions on on the continent of Europe, right? As well, well as, of course, as we'll get to, the Soviets actually had a role in the Spanish Civil War. Um, a very significant one, yes. Yeah, a very significant one. But in 1909, they don't exist yet. We don't have the uh, 
uh, NKVD coming into Spain in 1909. I assume you you, know? you do have you do have a lot of interconnected European radicals though. Um, and of course, the the two things about Russia and Spain is that you can actually compare them fairly closely because um, oh. they, they they both sit at opposite ends of Europe. Mm -hmm. They're both very agrarian. They both have powerful religious orders and strong monarchies, mm -hmm. and they both have a very militant underclass, which is trying to overthrow them by means of force, right? You know, Russia and Spain both have tremendous issues with bombings and terror attacks and uprisings all the time. Um, there's a very famous incident called the Morale Affair, um, which I believe this would have been 19, would have been 1908. I think it was 1908. Um, because it was when Ezra Pound was in Madrid as well. Um, it was it was during the wedding of King Alfonso XIII to uh, Queen Anna, um, when as his as the kind of royal um, couple were going down the street in their in their horse and carriages. Uh, sorry, horses and carriage. Um, an anarchist uh, threw a bomb disguised as a bunch of flowers from a window at them. It missed. And went off just behind them, killing a number of um, people who was who was stood around. And there's a fantastic photograph of it, which won which won the um, I don't know what the, the what's the major prize for it's not the Nobel Prize is it, is it the Nobel Prize for, for, for photography or, or whatever the equivalent is um, of uh, because his his camera shutter went off just as the bomb did, and it's a wonderful snapshot of this moment of pure chaos. Um, that's worth looking up. If you, if you just type in the morale affair, it'll come up. M-O-R-A-L-E-S? Um, uh, it's uh, M-O-R-R-A-L. Um, wow, okay. When it, whenever I talk about Spain, I can't help but bring it up because it's such yeah, a wonderful yeah. picture. Then I'll deal with the more systematic left-wing terror after this. Right, anyway, go ahead. I was just looking it up for my own interest. Pulitzer Prize, I didn't know, that's right. didn't know about it. Um, the Pulitzer Prize is the one I was thinking of, yes. Um, or was it was it established that early? Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, so yes, it does have all this kind of this hotbed of unrest. And you know, in let's let's be completely real about about this. If you read accounts of life in Spain at this period, you can see why. You know, there's there's a reason that the working classes in Spain are turning to a million strong anarchist union, a two million strong, uh, you know, confederated trade union of labor, a reason that they're fed up with um, the messages of, 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 of Christianity at this point, because, you know, things are excruciatingly bad in many places. And there's just things are reaching a breaking point where they're saying, well, look, we're starving. Everything is corrupt. The state doesn't care about us. What else are we supposed to do? Um, and there's actually a, a problem that the, the church has a, a, a term for it. It's called, um, uh, it's the, I think, it's, yes, there you go. There's the, the morale affair, uh, which should be coming up just now on, this, on the screens. Oh, it's not show. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I got confused there. Yes, sorry, my mistake. Um, so, yes, it's conditions are genuinely very bad. Um, and you know the the way Spain is governed at this time, just to give an insight quickly, is on paper it's a kind of British style constitutional monarchy. There's a king, there's a parliament, and every couple of years you have elections for those parliaments. There's a conservative party and a liberal party. In reality, this system is called El Turno, which literally means turns or uh, the, the 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 peaceful turn, where the king will meet with the leaders of the liberal and conservative parties, which aren't really opposed to each other. They're, they're all part of the same elite of, you know, landowners, um, industrialists, career politicians, etc. And the king will discuss with his ministers and they will say, OK, and the king will decide beforehand who's going to win the election. Yeah. Um, wow. Very often it's it's whoever wasn't in power last time. So it'll be conservative, liberal, conservative, liberal, conservative, liberal. Right. Um and then the message will go out to the local bosses or um, caciques, I believe it's pronounced, which literally means chief. And in all the regions and the constituencies, there's like a local sort of bigwig mafia type boss. And he will then make the election in his constituency. So if the king has decided that the conservatives have to win, then the local boss will make sure that the, that the ballots come out, you know, uh, 
1,300 votes for the Conservative candidate, 500, 500 votes for the Liberal candidate, you know? Um, that's how elections work in Spain at this time. So, you wow. know, it's it's not it's not like you can really achieve much through the ballot box. You know, the mm-hmm. the, the first step is to kind of grab a rifle and, and become part of a union, if you see what I mean. Um, right. So, yes, which, well, which is, it's, church. So, it's, it's complicated for us, right, because we don't really believe in democracy anyway. But um, no, this was a sort of more more explicitly a sham of a democracy than ever. Right. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, it's interesting because you can read this. I, I can tell people about this now and everybody just says, oh, it's just like America now. Right. Yeah, right, <laughs> like, right. You know, exactly. You know, yeah. it's essentially that's that's what you're living under. Right. I mean, um, that's <laughs> it is interesting. Um, but yes, uh, because like if I went back even like five or ten years and did the same thing, the reaction among even quite sort of right right wing Americans would, would would be like, oh, that's funny. What what an archaic, funny Spanish uh, sort of you know corrupt Latin type system. You know, it's lucky mm-hmm. that we don't have that. And of course, <laughs> you know, um, now now everyone does. Yeah. So yes, it's uh, not not fun. It's, and everyone has first hand experience of that system. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So, so you were saying that the, there were there were reasons for frustration. Um, there were reasons for frustration and yeah. the 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 church was aware of this and there's discussions with this problem of the apostasy of the masses where in some regions of Spain um less than like 5% of the of the of the populace attends mass for example um right this this doesn't then it's quite interesting because this doesn't mean that the populace wouldn't consider themselves catholic mm-hmm. for, but for whatever reason they just stop engaging with the church right um or they, yeah. they still believe in, in Christ somehow. They just they just stop showing up. Right. So um, so the church is like, yes, yeah, Spain is Catholic, but behind the curtain they're they are they well, they are aware that they're in a they're in a um tenuous position with the populace. Spain Spain is very Catholic. I mean it still has an enormously devoted Catholic population. Uh the Catholics Catholic ceremonies like the Corpus Christi are observed with great reverence every year. Mm. The thing is, it's 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 not as cut and dry as are you or are you not a Catholic, basically, because, yeah. for example, I mean, in Spain, there's a great anecdote that Paul Preston, the, the left wing historian, tells about towns in Spain that voted that where like 98 percent of the population voted for the most extreme communist party. Mm-hmm. And then. And then when that when when the communist mayors and and, and local officials were, were were elected, they said, right, um, all all icons of the Virgin Mary have to be removed from public display. And these townsfolk who had just voted for the communists would form a mob to protect their Virgin Mary statue. They mm-hmm. would say that right. statue's been there for a hundred years. You're not taking it down. That statue's staying there. You know. Right. 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 Um, and there's, well, this there's, is, there's a lot of kind of this is the old bundle uh problem um right mm. that with of politics which is that um you know you, you have to pick between two bundles or a couple bundles and yes. the reason you're picking a bundle may have nothing to do with the other things you get in the bundle right precisely right precisely. so they're 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 upset for maybe economic reasons and then the guys start going after their statues and they're like <laughs> That's not why we voted for you. Exactly. What are you doing? We don't want right. you to take away our statues and bash the church. And yeah, exactly. Right. It's, right. it's yeah. that's that's the trouble you have. I mean, um, so I want to fast forward now, uh, yeah. where I should I should have I should have got to, got to here a while ago. It's so it's 1931, and um, uh, after a period of, and a kind of, so the, 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 there's a military dictatorship which tries to reform Spain along kind of almost slightly fascist lines, where there's this kind of populist dictator comes to power called Miguel Primo de Rivera. He wants to pass several kind of grand reforms. He, he's a very sort of stolid, traditional, conservative, aristocratic, right-wing man. He's also a kind of populist drunkard who goes on enormous binges and then writes, you know, um, pro- grand proclamations. And then the next morning he wakes up in a hangover, realizes the stupid things he said and has to hurriedly try and re- rescind them before they hit the presses um <laughs> that's 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 the sort of a day in his life and wow th- unfortunately this fails because he's unable to kind of realize this project at, at, at the beginning he has to support basically the entire country you know right-wingers love him because mm-hmm. he's a strong man 
uh, reformists love him because he's gonna he's gonna sweep away this old corrupt parliamentary system and bring in something new. Mm-hmm. Um, the the left wingers love him because he's gonna he's gonna introduce reforms they like. Um, it, it just doesn't pan out. It collapses after eight or nine years, and there's a there's a genuinely free and fair election. Well, as genuine and free. So and I'm fair sorry, election. eight or nine Spain. years. So you're saying this is through the twenties? Yes, this okay. is uh, 1921 up to 1931 basically um pretty much bang on 10 years i believe um and in in 1931 um the military dictatorship collapses the king is panicking because he doesn't have the dictatorship anymore all his old parliamentary allies have abandoned him because he let a coup happen that swept them all away from power Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the military is at best unsteady and the chief of the army who's a monarchist himself comes to the king and says i can't guarantee that the army will support you in the event of a popular uprising basically um and so the king calls an election in 1931 which is basically an unofficial referendum on the monarchy um and the election happens and the the, the, what, what actually happens is the monarchist conservative parties do win a slight majority over the Republican leftist parties. But because it's pretty much a 50-50 split, the king doesn't want to risk a civil war, so he leaves Spain. Um, he goes, to, he flees to France. He doesn't officially abdicate, but he just leaves because he oh. doesn't... He, I mean, he basically, there's nothing else he could do at that point. He doesn't have the control of the situation. Um, and he's not willing to risk, you know, kind of a mob smashing in the windows of the palace and stringing him up. Um and of course, you have to remember that in Spain, um, whether or not you win the election doesn't necessarily mean that you have to see it that way, if you see what I mean. So <laughs> a, a recurring theme in the history of this period is that the left will win, uh, will will lose by a small margin or win by a tiny margin and then go out on the streets and act as if the revolution is here. You know, mm-hmm. they'll, yeah, right. they'll, 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 they'll beat up. Uh, mayors they don't like they'll fling open the jails and free all the political prisoners you know mm-hmm. they'll it, it doesn't matter the actual the constitutional the constitutional process becomes nil and they just do what they want basically um just complete complete disorder um so that that is a common problem so so you now have you now have the second spanish Re- republic of 1931 and this is where it starts to get systematic basically um and what begins to happen is that the two visions for Spain crystallize. On the right, you've got the um, uh, confer- uh, Confederación Española de Derechas Autónomas, which means, ba- it, it basically, it means the, the um, Spanish Confederation of Right-Wing Parties, um, which is a colossal, gigantic union of all the right-wing parties in Spain, pretty much. Um that forms a single big conservative block and competes in the elections. It does so quite successfully. Um, mm-hmm. uh, it actually wins the most seats in 1933, but um, the government, it, it, it's kind of, this is the big problem Problem with, with the Republic is that all of the politicians that run it, uh, the, the presidency and the, and the civil servants are all leftist Republicans. Uh-huh. So they don't respect the constitution so that they've just written. So when the right wing wins a, a massive landslide in 19. 19- 33 they refuse to let them take um government inst- and instead appoint a uh, a kind of centrist republican party to rule the country mm. um you know it's, it's it, you know it's like it, again it's it's of course the republic collapsed you wrote a constitution and didn't abide by it and just you know played a completely corrupt game you know yeah um so it was bound to collapse and, and on the left you have um the POUM which is the major socialist party you also have the, the mainstream communist party. You have like radical sort of bourgeois liberals. You have kind of anarchists and Trotskyists, etc. cetera. Um, and the two sides just start to come apart. Um, you know, and I mentioned the turn it. We, we did a stream basically on um, the killing of um, Jose Calvo Sotelo, who was a, a right-wing leader and a notable monarchist um, politician who is um, taken from his home in the middle of the night by uniformed 
Republican police officers of the newly formed Republican assault guards because the, the Republican regime can't trust the old monarchist police force. So they need a new fit. So they literally, they found their own. And by, again, by uniformed Republican police officers, he is shot and dumped in the street, you know. Um, I'm sorry, I what, mean, what, what year is this? Uh, this was right before the Civil War. This is 1936. This is one of the okay. events that actually kicked off the coup. Um, right. You know, again, it's like, this is the kind of thing that the Republican regime will do, whether it's like, whether it's the leadership or like communist, communist activists on the street, they will sanction this kind of thing. Um, See, th- th- this is where, as an American, this story is a little bit hard because of the term Republican, because it yes. has sort of the double meaning for us, you know, the Republican Party, which is, you know, as you know, kind of milk toast, right? Um, mm. Or classical Republicanism, little r Republicanism, right? Um, which you, on paper would be similar to Republicanism in Spain. But I think in practice, American little r republicanism and what you're describing have very little to do with each other, because well, you don't you don't you don't um, uh, take out uh, opposition politicians and shoot them in the street. You know. Well, it's so here's here, here's the problem, as you say. So yes, I understand the Americans have a different view of it now. In, in Spain, Republicans. No, I'm, I'm not saying mean... we have a. I'm not saying we have a different view. I'm just saying that the term Republican makes it a little yes, hard I, to sorry, understand I'm... how radical the Spanish Republicans are for us, so, right? Just, just that terminology. Just, just to kind of clear that up, um, re- Republican in Spain, on paper, it just means that you support the Republic. It means that you don't want a monarchy, you want a Republic. Right. The issue is that the, that the issue of the monarchy becomes a kind of um, a standard, if you see what I mean. So if you're a right-winger, if you're a Catholic, if you're a traditionalist, probably going to be a monarchist aren't you if you're any kind of progressive liberal radical communist you're going to be a republican you don't believe in kings if you like that kind of thing so it's again there are you know right-wing republicans in spain but realistically right-wing equals monarchist left-wing equals republican you know the 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 republic becomes a rallying cry for the leftists the 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 return to the monarchy becomes rallying cry for the right wing some of the monarchist parties are very powerful um so in the in the spanish civil war context when we hear republican uh what would be a good drop-in replacement for an american just left wing kind of uh any anywhere from sort of liberal reformist to hard out trotskyist basically um Right, right You know, that that side of the spectrum is what I mean. And so during this republic, you just get this total collapse of civil order. Um, You know, you get literally gangs of right wingers and left wingers roaming the streets looking to hunt each other down. You get running gun battles down major avenues of Spanish cities. Um, As I mentioned, there was the killing of um, Jose Calvo Sotelo, the monarchist leader. Um, during the election campaign, it's bitterly fought. The election campaign of 1936 between the major right wing and the major left wing parties. Um, the propaganda campaign launched by the right wing is colossal. I, I don't. I honestly don't think in modern Western history there has been an election campaign that was as intense as the one that the right wing fought in 1936. I mean radio broadcasts planes dropping leaflets mm-hmm. um hot air balloons that went up at night with electric slogans on them that you could see from all around the the, the the major areas you know there were trucks with film cameras inside them that projected onto the outside of the vehicle um and went around the streets and had sound playing this was incredibly radical technology for the time mm-hmm. of course the, the the right has the backing of um not only the old aristocracy and the landowners but the capitalists as well, because the capitalists don't want to, don't, obviously don't want communists and and and, and kind of um, and that kind of thing to get into power. So they're they're back backing the right. So they've got a lot of money. Um, there's 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 a case where thumbtacks are spread over the roads so that if like right wing leaders are coming to give a speech in your town and you're a leftist, you put thumbtacks down to try and 
um, burst their tires. And of course, in <laughs> in you know in the 1930s, it's not like you 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 can't just call out you know the the, the roadside uh, uh, help people. You know, it's it's quite a more laborious thing to get a tire change. So um, you see these images from the period of all these cars with broomsticks strapped to the front of them <laughs> to clear the thumbtacks out before they get to the tires. It's incredible. <laughs> Um, um, hey, real, you know, real quick, real, uh, real nice. quick footnote. I ran into this in my reading as well. The King's Hussar says Basque nationalists, although they were on the Republican side, were quite Catholic and maintained relations with the church. Similarly, just I, I, I didn't want to come back to this, but just real quick, when we get to some of the brutal attacks on the church, it doesn't happen with the Basques. So the Basque region is uh, like the, the exception to a lot of the stuff that we're going to say here, right? Oh, I, I, I will, I will have to say the only, the only answer mm. I can give is that the regionalist question is too complicated to get into yeah. right now. We just exactly. we don't right, have right. it's, you know, it's a, it's a colossally complicated area when dealing with Spain. Yeah. Um, you've got the Basques, the Navarrese, Catalans. It's yeah. I'm I've deliberately left it out for now. And right. I'm just treating we, Spain as as, as one right. Thing. We're, we're we're simplifying a bit. Understood that the story in some of these uh, yes. regions with their own identity was way more nuanced, especially in the Basque region. But anyway, uh, yes. continue. Um, Let's continue example, general, generalizing. I know that the Basque, for example, the Basque and the Navarrese regions are where you have the famous Carlists. You know, the the um, the the kind of ultra Catholic militia with the with the red hats, um, for example. Um, so. Yes, you've got you've got like right wing youth are uh, going around with like weapons stashed on them. Um, you know how during the whole culture war era, um, Antifa would like run into like an event that Jordan Peterson was giving or whatever, and mm -hmm. like blow whistles. Um, right. That was going on very commonly. Yeah. Um, you know, it was it was, and then th there was an, there's an interview that a that an, an old an old um, nationalist gave like sometime in the 1980s when he was like really really old, um, and he was talking about what it was like in the 30s, and he has this line which has always stuck with me ever since I saw it, where he says, "In 1936, if you saw a socialist or a communist walking down the street, you didn't see a Spaniard or another man, you saw Satan himself." coming down the street you know wow. that's that's what it felt like i mean <laughs> this is it's it's to the, you know these people are ready to just slit each other's throats and that's what's going on even before the civil war you know violence is constant deaths are racking up the political violence um people are being thrown in jail for political crimes then then mobs are like mobbing the prison and, and, and fr freeing them um it's it's absolutely terrible it's it's the, the disorder is just rife and the, the Republic can't keep a lid on it. And as I say, the more than anything, I think the event that delegitimizes the Republic, not only in the eyes of the, of the army generals and the right wing, but in the eyes of a lot of actual Republicans too, is that the murder, the assassination of Jose Calvo Sotelo by uniformed officers of the guard. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, right. I actually compared this somewhat to, the FBI raiding Trump's house um, mm -hmm. because it almost had a similar ring to me where it's like uniformed officers of the government doing clearly just like partisan sort of tactical. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sort of mm -hmm. partisan strikes against the main leader of the opposition. You know, right. it's just, that's, that's what it smacks of it. I mean, to the point where when, when the military officers start their uprising in 1936, Lots of very prominent Republican Republican intellectuals support it. Hmm. Um, they actually write manifestos saying we support this because when you have to understand when the coup kicks off, it's not like so. I mean, it it isn't this like right wing ide ideological thing where they're going to bring back the monarchy and reinstate the church and all this and all this. It's just it was just a coup. And it was assumed that the coup was Republican in nature. It was going to take control of the Republic and clean up the Republic by military force, basically restore order. Um, so many intellectuals did support it. Of course, mm. it didn't pan out that way. But yeah. Um, but yes, that, I mean, that's how bad things are. Um, I should, to get back to the topic of the attacks on the church, um, it is explicitly clear to me, and it's explicitly clear in their own words, that the goal of the communist, socialist, leftist factions 
was the abolition of Christ, basically. Mm. Um, in their view, there is no such thing as Christian socialism or Christian progressivism. There can, to them, Christianity is this sort of esoteric old cult that they need to cleanse out of Spain, you know. Um, That's interesting. So, which, right, course, this, is, this is a big journey because uh, Christian socialism had been a thing in Europe, say, a hundred years before. Um, mm -hmm. Quite prominent uh, variant of socialism, I would say. But Marx, I think in particular, had combined uh, socialism with atheism and with anti-religion. And it seems like that yes. was making more and more headway as you get to the late 19th and early 20th century, so that you're saying by the time you get to the 30s in Spain, that that's just part of the part of the bundle of socialism is to be anti-Christian. In Spain, yes, and and I, I don't, and it's not just it's not any kind of mild anti-Christianism or kind of yeah. like intellectual atheist stance. As I said, it is the abolition of Christ. I, I right. choose that I choose that language very specifically. Um, you know, there's that famous picture I'm sure everyone's seen of the militiamen doing a mock execution of Christ. Um, you know, they uh, statue tear down. Is that the one? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Um, you know, tearing down churches again horrible atrocities committed when the coup breaks out and and it just it collapses into war i mean to the point where you know nunneries are broken into and all the nuns are just raped right. um and then murdered um, right okay so let, where, let, it, let, let's slow down a little because 1936 <laughs> is in, in my brief uh reading on this <clears throat> is actually where most of the atrocities against like priests happen um, that's when it gets at its worst yes that's at its worst. It continues for the three years of the Civil War, but but 1936, I understand, is when most priests were killed. Um, uh, yes, because you've got basically a frustrated radical population. So you've got the the kind of anti-clerical pro-Republican masses see the Republic as their means of political achievement, their means of reform. And when this coup breaks out, there's a feeling that, you know, well how how dare the military and the right wing try and take away our republic by force so there's this kind of anger this lashing out where you know if if you're a kind of angry um you know worker who's part of a militia and things are all things are kicking off then the easiest target available to you is the local church the nearest monastery the nearest the nearest place of worship you know um the church is probably weakly defended it's got mm. lots of gold and valuable things in it you know let's go and burn it down after all because the thing is you know it's humans humans like trashing things right like it, it just <laughs> and it just it just becomes an excuse to trash things after a while and if and if if, if your goal is the abolition of christ and you, and you see the church as, no, as, as nothing more than this absurd kind of criminal relic then you'll then you know why wouldn't you burn it to the ground you know that's, that's, okay, that's the so, attitude, isn't it? So there's an aspect of this that I don't understand. As you explained earlier, even um, villages or whatever that would vote very strongly for communists did not want the, uh, they were not voting for the church to be abolished. So mm. is this a, um, is this a popular movement, the attacks on the church, or is this a minority of radicals? It's, it's a sizable minority of radicals that would actually go and attack a church. Um, the average Spaniard cares about politics, but I mean, it's basically this the same as in, as in any country ever. I think the, the majority of people are not violent. They're not vengeful. They just want peace. You know, they just want to do their jobs, go to work, run their businesses, you know, see, see their family. They don't, Nobody is nobody except a few are actively wishing for hell to come down on Spain as it does. Um, mm -hmm. right. But you do have these very, very radicalized ideological mobs of workers and intellectuals and, you know, radical students who will happily just torch churches. You will always have this malcontent element that will, you know, attack nuns, rape nuns. There's even this element that actually digs up the corpses of saints, um, digs up the remains of saints and commits terrible acts with them. Um, you know, 
just because the fervor reaches that pitch. Um, wow. And um, it, yes, it's it's you know, it's it just it. I, I can't really put into words the 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 the, the depravity um, that that it reaches in Spain at this time. Yes, I mean, I will. I'll get some hard numbers for you now. I've, I've mostly been rattling off of my own head here. Um, so the uh, was this, uh, on clergy. So um, it says that of 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 the thirty thousand priests and monks in Spain in nineteen thirty six, thirteen percent um, of so 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 it's believed that six thousand eight hundred religious personnel were killed in nineteen thirty six alone. So that's right. nearly seven thousand. Seven thousand clergy are killed in one year, mostly before July, in the first six months of the year. Um, right, and I this mean, is sparked. You know, we we left the sequence of political events, but very briefly, this is sparked by a failed coup, right? So yes, in nineteen thirty six, um, the military um, begins to plan a coup because the republic is, you know. It's it's not even that they're not willing to work under a republic. It's just that the place is collapsing into anarchy, and there's a fear of an of an imminent communist revolution. Um, you know, a kind of um, they 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 worry that the leaders they have in the political sphere are like what Kerensky was in in Russia. You know, a kind of um, liberal bourgeois president who is swiftly sort of replaced by Lenin you know that's that's what they're worried about they're worried about this kind of mm -hmm. Leninist putsch so the military plots a coup um the the coup goes ahead they're able to seize Spanish Morocco the Canary Islands large chunks of Spain they don't take Madrid they don't take the majority of the country their territory is concentrated over in the west um where which is generally more right-wing than the east Oh, okay. So when um, I read failed coup, that's not quite fair. It's more that um, it, it was an incomplete coup. They retained yes, control. They, only, they retained control of those regions you just named. They, well, they were only able forth, to take. But... They were only able to take a percentage of Spain with the coup. Right, okay. It was. It was right. intended. It was intended as a swift, singular operation to, to be in power. Right. You know, within the next twenty four hours, didn't pan out, yeah. um, because um, immediately. Um, some of, of course, not all of the army was so right, was so convinced. Some generals mm -hmm. didn't go along. Um, large mobs of workers and and kind of republicans um, took up arms and came out on the streets and fought the military and won in some cases. Um, so you know that's basically why. And then of course, hey presto, it's a civil war. Um, so yes, um, and if you happen to be a priest stuck on the republican side of that of that war right. you're in for a bad time you know just like if you're a known communist on this on the who gets caught on the on the nationalist side you know yeah i wanted to mention trouble. mention very briefly i watched uh, because it was I, I was just watching through a bunch of films that were highly rated by a certain film reviewer who uh does not have my political views um but anyway he recommended land and freedom <clears throat> a film from 1995 directed by ken loach um and it's mm. about the Spanish Civil War. And I remember being sort of stunned. Here's how the Wikipedia entry d describes this one scene. It says, Another important moment in the movie inspired by actual events is the execution of a village priest for acting in favor of the fascist side. He has broken the seal of confessions, telling the fascists where the anarchists were hiding and causing their deaths. The priest is also shown to have a bruised shoulder from firing a rifle. And then they execute him. So the things that struck me were... Here's something that's, uh, what, 1994, so we're talking nearly 60 years after the events, and here's someone who is not even Spanish, Ken Loach, right, who mm -hmm. is portraying the execution of a priest during the Spanish Civil War, and then in the movie, they sit down and they, like, explain why it was justified to kill the Spanish priest. And I thought, okay, yes. if 60 years later, they're still depicting the execution of a priest and justifying it, then at the time itself, they must have really been going nuts, <laughs> right? Because this, um, is, this, I... is the, this is the tame version that they're giving us, right? Well, do you, are you familiar with who Ken Loach is? No. Is he a big commie? 
he's a he's a he's a he's a kind of traditional left wing like sort of trade union working class mm. uh style leftist um his his filmography he's he, he is actually quite a talented filmmaker mm-hmm. um but his filmography is quite ideological you know he yeah. um he 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 became famous for what we call kitchen sink dramas where it's like a kind of very realist gritty sort of you know film or play about like you know a working class family you know oftentimes you know lots of arguing in the kitchen hence the kitchen sink drama you know mm-hmm. um that kind of thing so yeah i can you know lots of leftist filmmakers love to make their kind of you know great homage piece about spain which is rife with you know essentially just republican lies um right <laughs> i mean you know the, i mean as, but as i said it, it, it you know you have to remember this the situation to, to try to grasp what it's like in spain during this time is very difficult and you know, yes, there there would have been priests on the side of the Republicans who had to just continue being priests. I mean, the thing is that when when we say Spain is a Catholic country, we don't just mean that people go to mass on a Sunday. It means that Catholicism is deeply imbued into the culture, even if you're, you know, a, a communist. You know. Right. You will still have grown up going to going to mass and receiving the communion every week. You will have been taught the Bible by a priest in school. You would have come into contact with the church constantly. You know, if it, it's like if, if you talk to Irish people who grew up in the Irish Republic prior to the 90s, how even if you're not really a Catholic, the church is just everywhere and you can't help be influenced by it. So, you know, the, the 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 way that morals work in a catholic country still somewhat applies even if you're a socialist you know you will see you you might still want to confess you might still want communion you know and mm. this is part of the issue actually with the republican faction is that this is part of the reason that they don't win and they're so disorganized is because they've got no real unity um mm-hmm. you know some of them are just bloodthirsty anti-catholic warriors some of them are committed Stalinists. Some of them are Trotskyists, so that they obviously hate each other with a passion. Um, there are anarchists who don't want to fight; they just want to establish communes. Um, there are kind of um, kind of quite right wing conservative people who just don't believe in monarchy, so are on the Republican mm-hmm. side, you know. So you know, a complete hodgepodge of of people. So you know. There'll, there'll, there'll be some Republicans who would shoot any priest they saw. There'll be some who, as like like in that Ken Loach film, would have had a priest with them who would have been, you know, giving communion and t- taking confession and such. Um, you know, it's very, very complicated as a situation. It's, there's, no, right. there's no black and whiteness to it at all. And, of course, right. remember that most Spanish people, I mean, this is the thing with, with, with civil wars. Most Spanish people who ended up fighting in the civil war did so because they happened to be on that side when the war broke out you know mm-hmm. if you lived in an if you were a young man who lived in a nationalist area it doesn't really matter what your politics were before that you're probably going to get drafted to fight for franco yeah you know? gotcha and you probably you probably won't kick up much of a fuss you'll just and do same it. and same in the republican controlled areas same in the same in the republican yeah. zone you'll you'll end up yeah. fighting for the republic it's it's mm that's how war works really i mean it's like how in during the english um civil war you know a a a town being royalist or parliamentarian was basically decided by whichever recruiters made it there first um to to, to spread the news of the war um (laughs) so um we're gonna have to wrap up uh in in pretty short order unfortunately one of the themes that jumped out to me as i looked over the um details about the uh terror ro- rojo i don't know if i'm saying that spanish any rojo is how i rojo. say it but yeah terror terror rojo the red terror um is the attacks on religious uh, as we mentioned um <clears throat> but also the uh torture um now maybe yes. it's unfair but i feel like one of the you know unbalanced but i feel like one of the themes i see is that um going back to like the french revolution uh the leftists uh tend to not just you know regrettably you know we got to win this war and you're in the way and we got to kill you sorry buddy um no it's there's there's more of a um uh cruelty 
uh, now at this point I'm not necessarily referring to, to the Red Terror in Spain, but uh, in the French Revolution, you know, they would kill the children before the mother, while the mother watches and then kill the mother. You know, that kind of like a, a, a egregious cruelty, as well as, of course, um, just demonic tortures and, and making Christians uh, perform a black masses that is, you know, sort of yep. satanic inversions of religious acts, uh, acts ceremonies. Of too. Yeah, acts of apostasy. Right. That all yeah. that sort of thing. Right. It's not just, um, you know, one one it's military vicious. force it's, it's fighting vicious. another. Yeah, there's cruelty. Cruel. There's viciousness. There's that's that's yeah. that's the sad thing about civil wars is that is that it's that's how they are. You know, mm. I think um, in general, a war between two countries, the soldiers don't necessarily hate each other, especially if they're from a, a professional army, you know. Mm. Um, I've, I, I don't have any military experience myself, but I have spoken to ex soldiers and they've talked about how they don't really hate the enemy. It's not the right word. They're, they're, they're there to do a job and that job is killing the enemy and the enemy is there to kill them, but it's not right. really hateful. Yeah. Compare that to something like the Spanish civil war. It is just vicious, vicious hate. I mean, mm. um, I feel like I've actually not done a very good job so far because I, I've not actually talked about how bad some of the persecution was. I mean, um, for example, b before the Civil War, um, when the Republic came into being, there was a very the, the first major obstacle it faced was that they during in the Constitution, I think it was Article Fifty One to Fifty Three of the Constitution, basically was an, a, a very overzealous anti-Catholic measure. It banned all Catholic schools, and you have to remember that every school in Spain before that is a Catholic school. Um, they banned Catholics from teaching, and they seize church land all in one fell swoop and even even lots of republicans say this is too far this is needlessly antagonizing the church they're saying you are going to get a right-wing backlash if you just attack the church needlessly um and lo and behold they get a right-wing backlash um mm. so you know um and there's there's some historians i've read who have said that this was the worst anti-catholic perse persecution essentially since the reformation i mean mm -hmm. that that is no it it's 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 just it's utterly vicious you know um all through the war as well yeah um, and um uh, it, it, this gets complicated but as we mentioned earlier uh the soviets actually get involved they decide to do it do. secretly secretly for various reasons <clears throat> and and um so the truth of it isn't really known until the soviet Rather archives half, half, full, fully opened until fully known until the Ooh. soviet archives are opened and then we learn a lot about how certain people are executed and so forth you know um and yeah. also they they often are acting against basically competitors on the left so they're acting against the POUM um yeah and yeah. and basically they they're one they're, I guess, it seems like they are expecting that the left will win, and they just want to make sure that they're the winning faction when it's over. And they somehow seem to lose sight that they could lose, which they end up losing, right? The left ends up losing. Well, I mean, this is this is the thing. The Most of the leftists, this has been said time and time again in the history of the war, they care more about defeating each other than defeating Franco. You know? Mm -hmm. um, they are more willing to fight ideological struggles between each other than than win against franco this is a lesson that the current right needs to learn very very hard you yeah know? right don't <laughs> don't waste time in fighting when you've got a bigger enemy to beat collectively you know <laughs> um right. and um you know it, but it but it does genuinely get to the point by the end of the war i think where there are some for example there are trotskyists who would rather live under franco than than let the stalinists win you know there are there are anarchists who would rather live under franco than let the let the socialists win you know just the the the, the bad blood between them is, is to that level and the other issue with the soviet union's aid is that it's really half-hearted um mainly because stalin is aware that a, re a successful revolution in spain would be in would be a net negative to communism um oh, why is that it just it would well the reason is that if so if, if there's a revolution in spain that would end the long period of, of, of relative peace and accord between the capitalist countries of Europe and Soviet Russia. Um, mm. Because 
all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, you, you're obviously just funding revolutions wherever you can. We're gonna, you know, we, we'll we, we'll destroy all the diplomatic hard work you've done to try and you know make overtures with Europe. That's over now. Um, also, because communist Spain will be a liability, because because there's still a because you know trying to establish communism in Spain would be nigh on impossible because you know well I mean look what happened you got the civil war you got a right wing coup you got half the population is still sort of Catholic conservative you know it's just not ready for a revolution you know it's not mm -hmm. Spain in 1936 even though it's atrocious is not where Russia was in 1917 you mm -hmm. know it's just you, yeah. you it's just not it's not there and and stalin is aware of this he knows that he knows that he doesn't want a revolution in spain really not yet he also knows though that he needs to be seen to be sending support to their comrades in spain because you know well why wouldn't we you know we're we're communists why aren't we supporting mm -hmm. right. communists against against the fascists of general franco you know um right. so he does he does send some aid and of course you may or may not know this um, as uh, as an economist will interest you, but uh, um, in ex in exchange for some limited supplies of weapons, the Republican government of the war sends the entire Spanish gold reserve to Moscow. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I knew about that. And they never got it back. <laughs> it's right. still, as far as I know, it's still there now. <laughs> and and for those back. who may not remember, Spain had ended up with a lot of gold because of its adventures in the New World. So oh, this yes. was not this was non trivial that they sent over to uh, Moscow. Yeah, let me read yep. from uh, the Black Book of Communism. It says um, in the chapter on the shadow of the NKVD in Spain, in 1936 to 1939, the country became a sort of laboratory where the Soviet authorities not only applied new political strategies and tactics, but also tried out techniques that would be used during and after World War II. Um, their primary, primary goal, according to this, you're disagreeing with that a little bit, was to ensure that the Spanish Communist Party, by now entirely run by the Comintern and then NKVD, seized power and established a state that would become another Soviet satellite. To achieve their goal, they used traditional Soviet methods, such as establishing an omnipresent police force and liquidating all non-communist forces. Um, yeah. yeah, funny thing about that, though, is that uh, those, those tactics were what the Bolsheviks did after they were in power, not before, right? Mm -hmm. so this is this is uh getting ahead of the game they, they needed to win yes. the civil war and then maybe you, you know you consolidate power uh they they went around the other way and they started trying to consolidate power before the war was even won and and well, yes uh, I mean, franco this is, won this is the issue with well, yes <laughs> <laughs> i mean but 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 again you know um stalin and the higher-ups were aware that that you know as 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 ideological as i'm sure they were pure Machiavellian political thinking had to win out. You know, they knew that um, if, as I said, if if there was revolution in Spain, it would do them a huge amount of harm. Hmm. Um, it would be colossal liability financially and materially, you know, with all having to support it. And also just because, as I said, it would turn every country in Europe firmly against the Soviet Union. You know, um, a, a successful revolution in Spain that was seen to have ties to the Soviet Union would have, Im I, I believe, it would have immediately basically caused a panic. You probably would have had much closer diplomatic relations with fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, and Britain and France. Mm -hmm. Those countries probably mm -hmm. would have been far more keen to work together to stop the spread of communism um, because they would have seen it now as a far more active threat. Okay. Um, I you see. know. Bolshevism right. so, is coming. So just finishing up on the, the terror of the Spanish Civil War, number one, um, you're being more even-handed than I usually am in the series and pointing out that there was uh, assassinations on both sides, terror on both sides, yes. real hatred in there was the, the it, Civil War. Yeah, it's. I mean, as, as I said, I if I was there now, I would enthusiastically be pro the nationalist side in whichever mm -hmm. way I could. But war and especially civil war and ideological war is a horrible 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 thing you right. know it's yeah. you read any account of the history of the spanish civil war it's it's just terrible reading i mean i, I keep saying the word horrible there's no other way i can describe it it's yeah, yeah. the atrocities just being committed on a daily 
basis by troops on both sides you know it it beggars belief just the petty spitefulness you know i mean you know um you know there's 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 a village near near your section of the line which has rumored to have been given has been giving information to the enemy or is like housed some soldiers of the enemy or given them supplies or something so you and your men go into the village and you shoot all the children to punish the village you mm. know yeah. um just just utterly brutal stuff sure. i mean that's that's what civil war that's what civil war is like you know that's what that's what all the civil conflicts in spain have been like it's just just tremendously tremendously hard fought right um, and so th this brings not, us back not in any way a nice thing this brings us back to um the uh point you made earlier which is that until quite recently they just didn't talk about it that much in spain <laughs> Because, yeah, it because was. They basically it had was a moral such. On it. It, it was such a mess. Left so much bitterness, right? People who yeah. remembered. They said, "We just, we just need to move on. We just need to yeah. get. We don't want to dwell on it. Let's go forward." Um, right. Yes, there was a moratorium. It, it was agreed, basically, that okay, look, Franco won. Spain is whole again. Spain is recovering. Just move on, you know. Um, we, we're not going to make films about it. We're not going to write huge books about it. We're not going to do dramatic art pieces. You know, um, we're just going to move on. And that's only recently be begun to, to come apart, that moratorium, um, because it's passing out of living memory very much so. Right. Um, and that means that lots of young, especially in the in the political climate of Europe in, in the present year, lots of young people are more willing to just, you know, say well i'm going to identify myself with my communist grandfather or i'm going to go to a rally and do the fascist s salute and be a francoist you know it's like the the young are kind of way more radicalized than they were you know 30 years ago for example in spain um i'm looking at a smithsonian article from 2018 the battle over the memory of the spanish civil war how spain chooses to memorialize yeah. francisco franco and the victims of his authoritarian regime is tearing the nation apart of course, this is from yes. a certain perspective. This is, right? but, well, <laughs> because unfortunately, a socialist government um, in the 2000s decided to kind of open up the scar by doing mm -hmm. this whole kind of like anti-Francoist sort of history thing mm -hmm. where, you know, they, they've, they've taken down any memorials he built. They've renamed streets that he named. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they're changing the history textbooks, and of course, the issue is that it's just dredging it all up. You know, everyone's right. arguing. You know, you know, and it's not it's not good. You know, I mean, Spain is a very fractious country, and and even now it's kind of teetering on the brink. I mean, you've got the regionalist movement, the monarchy is kind of wobbly, um, the politicians are very corrupt. Um, the church is obviously in decline. There's huge issues with immigration and poverty and the economy's tanking. I mean, you know, let's, it, it could happen all over again. <laughs> basically. Okay. I mean, you know, here we things go. Are, I, things, I got a, things are not good. As... I got a clue from the King's Hussar. Um, the act of forgetting, he says, here's what I found. Pacto yeah. del Alvido, the pact of forgetting the political decision by both leftist and rightist parties of Spain to avoid confronting directly the legacy of Francoism after the death of Franco in 1975. It was an attempt to move on from the Civil War in subsequent repression and to concentrate on the future of Spain. So yes, this was, uh, what What did they do? Did they actually sign something? I, I don't really... Uh, um, no, I don't think it was a physical a... document, but it was, you know, a kind of, an, an, it was an idea of how they would go forward. Right, and it's interesting because the, the way they're, Painting it here is that um, Zapatero in 2004, socialist government passes the historical memory law and um, starts, yeah, removing symbols of Francoism and so forth, right? And the idea is look, we've got to remember the horrible things the fascists did. But the thing is, it's a two way street, as we've been discussing. If, if you're going to dredge up what the uh, Francoists did, you've got to, you're going to yeah, end up talking right. about what, what the uh, left. The commies and and the socialists and the anarchists did right. Well, this is the this is the trouble. I mean, it's no it, one's going to come out looking pretty. <laughs> no, exactly. And when I started reading about this, I mean, it's just sad. I mean, to see this happening, it doesn't this doesn't need to happen, you know. Um, as somebody in the chat pointed out, that they, they, they even they even 
dug up Franco's remains and moved them to a lesser tomb, you know. Right. I mean, it's just, it's just petty at this point. Um, right. Of course, I think the ruling party of Spain is the PSOE, um, which was around in the 30s and played a role oh. in the Civil War. Oh. So they do have some kind of legacy interest in being anti-Francoist. But um, yeah, it's um, it's it's a very candid situation there right now. It's not good. Okay, like well, I've headed. just got to stop. I'm, I'm, I'm late to uh, pick up a son from right. something. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. I, I uh, would say that this <clears throat> Spanish Civil War, as you painted it, is uh, more complicated, and, or, or, well, <laughs> more complicated. I shouldn't say it that way. The, the um, atrocities are on both sides, I gather, in the Spanish Civil War. Now, we didn't get into this, but I gather that both during the war and, and also after there was um there were reprisals <laughs> by the winning side there were yeah there were very much so um right. uh i also the, the 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 really bad nationalist atrocities um were to do with the i don't i don't, I don't mean to hold you back sorry but the with the, they were they were to do with the um the moroccan troops um franco had this core of elite moroccan um troops from the spanish colonial um territories who were battle-hardened uh veterans of, of the wars there and you know in the beginning of the war these these moroccans with their experience were just eating up all these communist militiamen who had never seen in mm -hmm. a war before you know they didn't mm -hmm. even know how to fire a rifle these these battle-hardened veterans of a, of a vicious colonial war just melted through them like butter and these these moroccans um were kind of very apt to loot and plunder they would loot um, they would um, often rape uh, Spanish women whenever they could. Um, mm. And it was seen as a kind of competition. And of course, they were trained in in the tactics they'd used to win the colonial war in Morocco, which was a ver another very vicious, mm -hmm. hard-fought war that involved lots of reprisals, you know. So they were, they were used to that kind of thing. So and it, it's, it's ironic because despite being kind of Catholic crusaders, the nationalists relied very heavily on these on these muslim troops um wow and of course the republicans despite their promises of you know equality for all they were big on racial equality they they brought over lots of american blacks to fight for them as well um despite that their propaganda was some of the most racialized propaganda you know prior to the second world war you've ever seen because it was like you know this this african moorish muslim menace is coming to rape you and Mm -hmm. and, and, and bayonet you and destroy your children and everything which, you know which to be um, frank was, was kind of true is what you're saying somewhat true yes yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, again this, this, yeah not 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 a, not a pretty war at all Spanish war. okay well i've absolutely got to run thank you very much uh panama hat as uh lady of shalot pointed out there is a um stream that was done on ryan turnipseed's channel the yeah. link is in the live way, chat way more yeah where, where you guys uh went on for more than 90 minutes i bet right uh, hours and hours and hours just and guessing hours. just guessing yeah um <laughs> and i thought we did a stream possible i know it's mad merc possibly with panama hat on this channel and i'm just i've got enough of a back catalog that i'm having trouble finding it but anyway to find out what it was yeah. Yeah. uh but anyway thanks again sir and i've uh got to run oh oh wait what am i saying there's the whole like um i don't know if there are any but uh let me just make sure i'm not missing any tips or super chats i don't think so what is it, October 13th? Um, okay, no, we're good. All right, thanks everyone. And we'll be back with um, uh, Econ Minis with Black Horse next week, which I, I notice has been getting a growing audience. Black Horse really brings it on those things. And uh, of course, unfortunately, there's a reason why people are tuning in because there's some dire economic things going on, especially in Europe. Um, that we're keeping a close eye on and trying to understand. So um, we'll have more of that analysis, I believe. Haven't confirmed yet, but uh, we should have more of that analysis as usual with Black Horse next week. And we will continue the Left Wing Terror series. We haven't even made it to the second half of the 20th century, where there are some <laughs> interesting things that people have really, really forgotten. I didn't There's even so know about them, and, and it happened when I was a child, and I didn't know about some of this stuff. So, um, okay. Thank you, sir, and bye, everybody.